just for a minute so that you can all see uh, the agenda since we're not in person and we can't pass out handouts. Um, what we do have uh, is a few different items to look at today. So actually first I'll just go to our, our main website to make sure that if you wanted to look, you can go ahead and peruse, uh, but hopefully you found this. Uh, this has our Zoom information. It also has links to our agenda, our previous minutes and meeting handouts. And these links just take you along to, they help direct you to our right menu bar where you can look at our current agenda, our current minutes. Uh, and then this other SCC documents tab is where I post all of our meeting handouts. So if you go to our agenda, you can see that we are going to start with uh, brief reports. Uh, we'll have a few special topics to talk about a couple zoning issues here in Spinard. Uh, uh, also Spinard Road rehabilitation. We uh, also will have a survey to ask folks to share input on traffic calming for the community. So a lot of uh, road development projects discussion tonight. Um, uh, brief committee updates, and then we'll have time at the end for community and neighborhood announcements. And that's a great time to um, let us know if you're new, if you've got issues that you're interested in or working on or need help on um, to, to share or other events, fun ideas, things going on. So with that, um, hopefully you've also been able to see our October minutes are posted and we also post the recordings of our the video recordings of our meetings on our website so uh, people can follow along. Um, but with that I'm going to start uh, to see if anybody would like to move our consent agenda to approve our agenda and our minutes. Do we have a motion. I'll move to approve. Uh, Arena moves. Do I have a second. I'll second. Thanks, Margaret. Any changes, discussion? I'm not seeing any. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take it all approved. And I'll just do some brief introductions for our executive committee members. And you can just wave <laughs> when I when I call you. Um, but we've got Meg uh, Milky joining us. She's our secretary, so she's taking our minutes. We have Irene Person Gamble. She's our vice president for the executive board. Let's see, we've got Irina Filipenko, who's our treasurer. We also have Peggy Auth, who serves as an auditor. We also have two more auditors that aren't able to join us tonight. Um, Tani Sekaricia and Julie Leonard also serve as auditors, um, but they are um, at other events this evening. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to us anytime throughout uh, this meeting or to follow up with us. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over for brief reports. We'll start with the assembly, then we'll go to the school board um, and an airport update. And because of the election, the assembly meeting was moved from last night to tonight. So we're, we're kind of in conflict with it, but we luckily have Judy Jessen joining us. She's an aide for the, our assembly members. So I'm um, glad to have you with us, Judy, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is my special assistant, Muffin. She's not supposed to be there. She's Sorry a really good that. prop. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, very present, not super helpful in any other ways. So um, today I mostly wanted to talk to you about the budget. Uh, we have a really quick um, slideshow on the budget that was put together by one of the assembly's full-time communication aides. Um, I made that presentation to be three minutes because I thought that's what the time limit was. So I'm relieved to see that it was five, but that also means that I wanna um, address one other thing that's been on specifically the Spinard Community Council members' minds, uh, which is that obviously Austin Quinn Davidson, who is the second representative for West Anchorage as acting mayor, um, uh, Cameron worked with Dean Gates, the assembly's attorney, to determine whether it was possible to fill Austin's seat while she was serving uh, as acting mayor. And so far, the answer is still that uh, being promoted into the acting mayor 
as part of fulfilling duties as the chair of the assembly, which is what happened to Austin, does not create the kind of vacancy that can be filled. Um, and so her seat will just stay open. I know that's a little bit discouraging, but uh, being represented by just one member of the assembly is not necessarily unique. Those are conditions that the downtown district deals with all of the time. West Anchorage actually has an advantage in that I work for both Austin and Cameron, and the assembly has been able to make sure that uh, Cameron receives the money that pays for my contract that Austin was receiving. So even though you only have one uh, rep, you have me as a full-time aide able to work double the hours that I normally do. So you shouldn't see a significantly decreased constituent experience. And hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better. Um, I wanna share my screen really quickly to transition to uh, the talk about the budget, which is the big thing coming up for the assembly for November. And I've never used uh, a slideshow screen sharing situation before. So please let me know if there's a problem. Um, I The first thing I wanted to do is thank Marissa Pimenta for putting this really quick, quick crash course together. There's no way we could give you a super comprehensive briefing on the budget in just five minutes, but I'm going to do my best starting with addressing the process. Uh, and I do want to uh, note that the information is going to be coming at you really quickly. I'll be putting a bunch of links in the chat that you can use to follow up, and we're happy to receive your questions anytime to get back to you as quickly as possible. We'll also be collecting all of the questions submitted by all of the West Anchorage Community Councils and putting them into a document with their corresponding answers to be sent out to each of the community council presidents that will hopefully make its way to you as well so that you have as many questions and answers to the budget as possible. So the process for the budget began in May when community council surveys were sent out. Um, those surveys were sent back. The results are posted online. I'll include a link to those in the chat. In June and July, departments weighed in about changes that they thought should be made to the budget, which were sent over to the mayor to make final decisions. In September, the mayor's preliminary budget was sent over to the uh, assembly and posted online. And in October, formal introduction of the mayor's budget to the assembly occurred. It's worth noting that even though the, we have a different acting mayor now, we're still using the same proposed budget that was put out in September uh, as a working document. And the reason is for that, that the assembly has total authority to make any modification that they want. So creating a new budget with the new acting mayor would have really slowed down the process in a way that wasn't determined to be uh, super necessary. Oops. Um, You'll see that the budget is mostly flat. There's a small increase, but we tried to uh, tried to make sure in the proposed budget anyway that positions stayed relatively flat. And you can see a nice uh, breakdown of what is public safety positions and what are non-public safety positions. Um, this is a pretty typical breakdown of where the funding sources are coming from it, for this year's proposed budget. Just like all the time, um, most of the budget is being funded by taxes that are inside the tax cap. Overwhelmingly, that's property taxes, but it also includes other taxes that are inside the tax cap, which are uh, things like the fuel tax, um, the marijuana tax, the alcohol tax is not included in the tax cap. And I have a slide to address that a little bit later. Um, Funding uses for the budget overwhelmingly should break down to personnel. This isn't my favorite breakdown of how we're spending that money. It's worth noting that 40% of the proposed budget is spent on police and fire directly. And there's a slide that shows those kinds of breakdowns based on which departments are receiving funds that I'll link in the chat when I'm finished with this. Um, the biggest thing on people's mind is that this budget does come with an accompanied uh, expected increase in property taxes in the amount of $100 per $350,000 of assessed value. And you can see the breakdown of where that increase is coming from here. I have ongoing questions about exactly what the nature of these natural growth escalators are. And so answers to those kinds of questions will be responded to via email after some follow-up conversations that I'm having with Office of Management and Budget, just because I'm not an expert in the way that these natural growth escalators work. And I'm sure that that must mean that other people have questions about them as well. The alcohol tax is what's on uh, everybody's mind. Alcohol tax, if you'll remember, was approved in the spring election. It's still on track to be collected beginning February 1 of 2021. Um, the municipality is fortunate to be able to dedicate funds. And so the alcohol tax funds were dedicated by the will of the voters 
to specific categories that you can see listed out there, mostly having to do with making Anchorage a much safer place. Um, the alcohol tax funds aren't currently listed in the budget, and that's primarily because alcohol tax is haven't been um, collected yet. However, there's been a lot of conversation about ways that potential funds could be spent, and that's what you'll see in the proposed usage column on the other side. Uh, the biggest expenditure by far is dedicating uh, significant resources to the Anchorage Health Department. This is mostly going to be used to dedicate, develop a dedicated team to address homelessness. Um, it'll staff out some public health positions and also support grants to some of our private partners who are doing really fabulous work, um, ending homelessness, addressing and preventing child abuse, sexual assault, and domestic violence. So that's really, really exciting. The next biggest line item is that Parks and Recreation is going to receive a significant bump in money that's going to mean that year-round camp abatement can occur. You'll notice that it includes storage, and that's something we've gotten a lot of questions about, but basically there are significant, um, I don't want to say barriers, there are certain criteria that have to be in place to have a successful camp abatement program, and that includes the ability for people to be able to reclaim their property. So the government doesn't have the authority to seize private property, um, and that's oftentimes what's happening when we're abating a camp really quickly. It's why right now the uh, abatement window is so long, seven days of notice, so that people can collect their property and move it out before the abatement process occurs. Not only do we need to have storage if we want to abate quicker than seven days, but we also have to have other places for people to go, which is why so much of the fund is being um, dedicated to supporting not only um, not only things like abatement, but things like uh, housing first strategies and other provider supports to make sure that we have all of the components in place that we need to continue to see abatement. Um, but we think year round abatement with all of these services is gonna be really helpful also in getting people connected to resources that are gonna help get them off the streets for good, which is a win-win for everybody. It makes Anchorage a much more pleasant place to live, a much safer place to live. And we all know that abatement, uh, even though it can be really helpful is sort of a, a temporary band-aid and we tend to see people just move a little bit further down the trail and it's not really an effective solution that residents can count on. So. Um, the last slide here is capital projects. There are capital projects um, listed into the budget. I find this map really difficult to, to read. And so I plan to forward on a breakdown of what specific capital improvement projects are slated for this Bernard area. Did I get it in in five minutes? That's pretty good. Thanks. Okay, Judy. great. <laughs> I apologize for the choppy delivery, my uh, talking points and notes. I didn't split those out very effectively for screen sharing. So I'll know for next time. No worries. Um, that was a lot of information. And I know you said you'll put in a lot of um, information into the chat, but will there, will there be any upcoming sessions or opportunities for people to learn more and ask more questions with assembly members too? Yeah, so if I remember correctly, the next um, work session on the budget is slated for November 13th, and that is where assembly members will be proposing their budgets. Work sessions are open to the public. I'm not sure how much public participation will be occurring at that work session. The final vote on the budget um, is scheduled the following Tuesday, pulling up my calendar to double check the date so that I'm giving you the correct information, 13, the 17th. Uh, and that'll be accompanied with a public hearing. So if you have things that you want to testify about the budget, you can use the established testifying system uh, system to sign up for testimony. And you can find a ton of great information about that on the assembly's website right on the main page, which I'll also link in the chat. I'm gonna be furiously dropping links in the chat. Okay, and we'll make sure to um, include that in the minutes, but also send it out to our um, listserv. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Judy. Um, Got to keep us moving. So I'm going to uh, welcome Star Marset to our meeting. Thanks for joining us with the Anchorage School Board. You're welcome. Um, well, we have a couple of things going on, as you are all aware. Um, we are moving forward with opening schools. Uh, there is going to be a special meeting next week. Uh, we're still scheduling it for a public meeting uh, with no testimony, but it's for the board to discuss and ask more questions about the opening since we weren't able to do that um, at our school board meeting yesterday. 
So that'll be happening. Uh, we are also getting ready. We've been working on our new five-year goals since uh, uh, April of 2019. So we're gonna be rolling the draft out to the community um, in a way that it'll be electronic. Um, it'll have a little video talking about what our goals are, very short. And then you can either say, yes, we like these goals, or you can make a comment about the goals and then they'll go into a Google doc, which we will uh, comprise all of the answers and take a look at it. And we will meet again in January uh, the board will to uh, either revise the goals based on the community input um, because those goals and guardrails are from our last uh, meeting with the community with students and uh, parents and teachers and uh, what we put together is what we felt uh, was valued then but things change. Uh, the other thing that we're, gonna, we're doing right now is we're talking about our budget also we have a tighter timeline our pro forma doesn't come out until after the 1st of December, and we have to turn our budget into the municipality by the end of February. So we have been having work sessions talking about that. We also are gonna be looking at right now, I think with the drop in enrollment, we're looking at about 15 million um, deficit in our budget. Um, it does look like that we will probably get more stimulus or CARES money, but we don't know when, we don't know how much, and we don't know what strings will be attached to it. So it could be a very um, difficult year for the school district as I'm sure it's gonna be for everyone. But those are the, we are also having on the 18th of November, a uh, session for anyone that would like to think about running for school board. As you know, there'll be uh, three board members uh, running for their seats, Dina Mitchell, Elisa Hildy, um, Elise Snelling, and then my seat will be up. So there'll actually be four open seats. So if anyone's interested, please reach out because we will, um, I'll see if I can't, I know it's on the 18th, it's probably in the evening, but it just talks about the being a school board member, what the role is, the duties, that sort of thing, and just answer questions for anybody that might be interested. And with that, I'd ask if there's any questions. Hey, hey Star. Yes. Hey Jared Dunbar here. Hey, I just. Hi. Um, hey, where was that? Was that a workshop that you were talking about? For, for the uh, the I'm sorry, the ASD like school board positions, like to give people an idea on what their what the mm -hmm. job responsibilities are. Right. It, yeah. It's uh. It's actually um, Alicia Hildy is going to be putting an on. And it's uh, an invite to anyone in the community that's interested in maybe uh, running for school board or just wants to know more about school board positions. And that is on the 18th at, I will tell you here in just a moment. Board service training. And it is, it's the 18th from 5.30 to seven o'clock. And it, there'll be a, a Zoom link. It'll be out on the calendar. Um, but actually, if you're interested, I would just call the school board, Katie Grant, um, our school board number, and let her know that you're interested. And she can send you the link. OK, awesome. Thanks, Dar. Do you want her number? I'm adding uh, it to uh, the yeah. chat. Yep, I'll take okay, it. Yeah. Seven, sure. Yeah, I'll put it in chat. I just added the calendar link and um, Katie Grant's email address as well into the chat. So thanks for that, oh, Star. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I don't see any, so thank you. Okay, thank you guys, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I will now pass it over to John Johansson with the Anchorage Airport report and I'll share my screen, John, so I could show the update sheet. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Good evening. I don't have a whole lot. There's not much on the update. I'll go through it very quickly. <clears throat> um, the, uh, there's been some revisions to the uh, coronavirus uh, travel, <clears throat> excuse me, travel restrictions. Um, well, now you don't have to get a second test uh, when you arrive in Alaska. 
so you can get get a test and and uh, be here for five days and get a a, pos a negative result on the test and then you're out of quarantine and and out of the other isolation type requirements. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we're back to the lake being frozen, not frozen enough to support aircraft, but soon it will be. And a uh, reminder that it is not a recreating area, it is uh, an airfield or an aerodrome as people call it. Uh, the voting item, I guess, is a little outdated. You could have voted uh, yesterday at the airport had you wished, um, regardless of where your, uh, what district you're in. Uh, same old reminder about the cell phone parking lot. We have these new electronic signs that uh, as you approach the airport on West International that tell you where the parking lot is. So you don't <clears throat> have to worry about that anymore, but please use it if you're picking up friends and family so we can avoid the congestion on the arrivals ramp curb. And as always, we're, we're looking for a bunch of uh, people to fill positions at the airport. Um, just kind of a little update on passenger traffic. We're still running about 50% of normal passenger traffic for this time of year. That's that's uh, how many passengers we have coming through. And the planes are, are you know, not, not fully filled <clears throat> because of separation requirements that the airlines have. So <clears throat> we're not exactly down uh, 50% on the number of aircraft, but uh, number of passengers are down 50%. <clears throat> Cargo is still up significantly uh, due to the lack of uh, Trans-Pacific passenger flights carrying cargo in their belly. It now, now all has to go in the cargo, in, the, in cargo, all cargo aircraft, uh, most of which stop here in Anchorage. So we've seen a pretty good uptick in cargo traffic. Uh, the only other thing I have is uh, Peggy Auth asked at the last meeting if I would look into some campaign signs that were up on uh, Lake Hood Drive. And uh, I uh, went and looked at them, actually Lake Shore Drive, not Lake Hood Drive. Um, and I notified the powers that be and uh, asked some questions about them. They appeared to me to be in the road right away and, and probably should have been moved, but um, I didn't, uh, I kind of lost track of the issue and, and didn't push it enough. So the signs are still there, although one's laying on the ground. So um, next election, I will be a little more diligent in making sure that uh, those signs are not in the road right away and are on the lease lots. Um, that is all I have. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or take yeah. any comments you might have. Thanks, John. It looks like Stan has a question and then Peggy and Bob. Hi, John. Stan Jones here. Hey, every time I'm on the yes, coastal sir. trail and I go around the end of, <clears throat> excuse me, a runway 33, um, I wonder to myself whether the airport has studied how much longer the erosion will go on before it becomes a threat to the, uh, to the runway. Is that something you guys have looked at yet? Well, we uh, worked with the Corps of Engineers probably about five years ago to kick off a reconnaissance study to determine if there really was a problem. So they hired a consultant and did some work in house and determined, yeah, there is an erosion problem. And uh, they gave an estimate of when they thought the runway might be impacted and the runway itself, they were projecting out 50 years. Um, coastal Trail is obviously a lot sooner, um, yeah. and uh, Point Warren's off drive. The, um, the Corps of Engineers uh, was going to proceed ahead with a feasibility study, which is basically a preliminary design, a bunch of site work, geotechnical investigation, hydro hydrologic surveys, et cetera. And they're trying to get that in the federal budget. It has to be budgeted specifically um, they are not having any success on that at the moment. Um, you know, if, if, it, if it were to get funded, you know, then uh, that reconnaissance study is about a three, or the feasibility study is about a $3 million project. And then uh, uh, we, we would share in that 50-50 with the feds. Um, and we might go to the muni and ask them if they'd chip in. But at the moment, the feds don't have the money for it. Um, and then, of course, there would be a 
funding of the construction, which is estimated, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but I think the total project design and construction was about 48 million estimated in the reconnaissance study. So we're looking at it, we know there's erosion, um, quantifying the exact amount, we, we haven't done a real good job of that, but yeah, that's an issue. So the, the figure you just quoted, 48 million, is that to sort of shore up the bank there so the erosion stops? That, that was that project. Yeah, what it would be is uh, what it would be is a bunch of large riprap at the base of the slope. Mm -hmm. the, the the slope is only failing because uh, it's getting undermined at the base down at at the tide level. Right. And so yeah, it would be a a big bunch of rock on at the base of the hill on on the uh, tidal flats there. Mm -hmm. So that would at least that's the concept. That would, that would arrest the erosion, but not fix anything that's already gone. Correct. Thank you. Thanks. Peggy and Bob. Yeah. Hi, John. Um, my question is, I've had several people ask me because they know that we talk to you. Um, what is going on in the west end of um, near the runway um, that goes out to Jewel Lake? There looks like um, there was quite a bit of earth move, you know, earth moving over the summertime. And uh, I, I, people were just asking me like if I knew what was going on and I thought perhaps you could tell us what the airport was doing there. Uh, well, you may or may not be happy to know that everything is done that's going to be done. Um, it was a project to <clears throat> address some safety issues, uh, some objects in the in the approach surfaces and uh, some some other safety related FAA criteria that uh, we didn't meet there that we had to address. Uh, it was uh, doing a little bit of realignment of the tug road there, dealing with some drainage issues, and uh, relocating the security, putting a new security fence in along uh, Jewel Lake Road and moving it back from the bicycle trail onto airport property, property probably about 30 feet. So everything that's gonna be done there is done. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, and we have one last very quick question from Karen. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Um, hey, I, this doesn't need to be answered uh, necessarily at this meeting, but um, just to kind of give a heads up since we're entering into the winter season, I'm curious where the project to um, collect the um, the de-icing chemicals is at. Well, there um, there isn't a specific project to collect de-icing chemicals. Um, there there hasn't been. Um, we are <coughs> currently waiting for well. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on related to that. We just got a, um, about a year ago, um, and we, we discussed it a little bit at the community council meetings, but we we upped our stormwater discharge permit that we have with the Department of Environmental Conservation, which addresses all kinds of uh, stuff that get discharged uh, through our storm drainage system, most of them into um, Cook Inlet, um, Kinnick Arm, et cetera. Um, so we have, an, we have an updated permit there and there's, there's some things associated with that permit that are focused on de-icing. Um, I, I don't have the details in front of me, but one of them is, is uh, to address foaming um, in springtime at the outfall that is there near the intersection of Point Warren's Off Drive and uh, and uh, West Northern Lights, you know, right there where that little campground, or not campground, but parking area overlook is. I think I just lost you. No, we can still hear you. Oh, no, I, okay, I just lost the screen. You're still there audio? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, somehow or other, you're not on my screen. Um, so that, uh, you know, that's that's kind of the status of that. Um, we are continually looking at ways to um, reduce de-icing and, you know, and, and, and lessen the impacts of it. One thing we recently did this fall 
was to, and we've been working this issue for several years, was to um, uh, eliminate the use of ethylene glycol. Um, and ethylene glycol, most people um, that view as being much more toxic, is generally what's in uh, um, automotive, uh, automotive uh, um, antifreeze. Um, very toxic to animals. Um, and we are requiring that everybody use propylene glycol. And propylene glycol is oddly enough in, is a food additive in many, many instances. Um, but the glycol does, regardless of how toxic it is, it, it does create, uh, it does have a very high biochemical oxygen demand. So it sucks oxygen out of waters when it's when it's in them. We had a significant problem with that. We, both ethylene glycol and propylene glycol do that. Um, when we had much more deicing chemical going into Lakes Hood and Spinard, uh, we had kind of a, a a dead lake there from an oxygen perspective. Very low oxygen levels because of uh, the bugs eating up the glycol or consuming all the oxygen in the lake. So. Um, we do have a new permit. We're working on issues associated with that, but there is no plan to collect the uh, glycol at the moment. Okay. I'm going to keep us moving. Thanks for that, John. Appreciate your time. Sure. Um, so the next couple Thank topics, you. yeah, the next couple topics we have are to discuss some rezoning issues. Uh, the first, we wanted to uh, well, we were, the community council was first approached about a proposed rezone for a property um, for R4M to, RA, to R4A. And then uh, there, at the same time, there's some amendment changes about what that R4A is. So we're going to get the experts here to talk about rezoning because I don't know what all of those letters and numbers mean without looking it up um, and following along uh, with that. So we wanted to first have Tom Davis here. Uh, he's a senior planner for the city to talk to us about the proposed changes for what R4A multifamily residential mixed use uh, district, a zoning district would be. And then we'll have JJ Brooks share his proposed uh, development plans for his property and why he's um, requesting a rezone with the city. So uh, first, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Davis to share more about uh, what this, this, this designation is and propose changes to it. So we'll have a better understanding of what JJ Brooks would then be requesting uh, for his property. So thanks for joining us, Tom. Appreciate you have, uh, having you tonight. Hi everybody, can you hear me or is my mic okay? Is it loud enough? And... Yeah, we can hear you. It's a little quiet, but hopefully people can turn up there. Okay. There's a sweet spot where it's perfect and then it doesn't work. So, so well, the planning department is uh, seeking comments from the public, including community councils, as well as individual community council members about a text amendment to our R4A district. And it is Anchorage's uh, mixed use residential district allowing apartments and it has a lot of flexibility to allow uh, businesses in that can uh, mix with the residences and create a true mixed use neighborhood environment all in one zone. So it's a, it's a special zone and it creates kind of the some of the spaces we see down in some towns in, in, the, in, the, in the South 48, where it has a, just a great urban pedestrian environment. And that's what it's designed for. And it's, it's on the books. And I'm just here to just brief you on, uh, you know, what, what is proposed to change in the, that district and why we're doing it and uh, when to comment by and to encourage the community council to take a look at these changes and, and, uh, and then take any questions really briefly about it. So uh, this is a text amendment to the ground rules for how people develop in the R4A zone. It doesn't change any zoning boundaries, <clears throat> but uh, what it's trying to do is it's trying to create a, a more pedestrian oriented environment. So uh, more street friendly buildings and um, 
just a nicer place making place to be in the zone. But it's also designed to allow the district to be a bit more flexible to allow a wider variety of uh, mixed use commercial businesses in, uh, uh, more types of restaurants, similar uses, and uh, more commercial space among those residences. And then just kind of make the district standards easier to follow, easier to use. You know, uh, your um, Spinar Community Council agenda for tonight uh, is really nice. It has a great link to right directly to the project. And you go in there and there's a couple of really visual info summary sheets. Uh, exhibit A info summary gives you a before and after one page summary table of what, how the, the district would change uh, under these uh, proposed uh, amendments. And then some great info sheets, uh, info sheets one and two about pedestrian oriented street frontages and uh, the way this, these changes will help avoid shadowing and other problems. So we, uh, we've put this out, it's, it's, it's initial draft, we're calling it community discussion draft. And uh, what we'd like to, to have is comments back to the planning department by December 11th. So basically a two month time period um, and, and uh, send those straight to us. Uh, the the uh, materials have our, 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 our contact information. Uh, your feedback would be really helpful for us to turn around again and in the first quarter of next year and turn around a, a public hearing draft that would go to the Planning and Zoning Commission. So we're seeking that input. Um, this comes from Anchorage 2040, the 2040C plan. Uh, soon after adoption, we held a, a, a May 2018 open house there in Spinard uh, the Spinard Rec Center and first introduced this project. Diverted off to downtown projects, uh, but we are back. There is interest in using this district and uh, we're hoping that it can help uh, reinvest and uh, promote housing in, in our neighborhoods. So long story short. So it, we, we would appreciate the uh, community council feedback or if, if uh, you have individual members of comments um, that would, that would be wonderful for us. And the, the lead on this is Colin Hodges, senior planner, and I am assisting him. So, um, and with that, any questions folks might have about these changes? Yeah, thank you, Tom. And I included the link in our agenda and I just posted it in the chat. It looked like some people were looking at it so you can actually see um, the info sheets that, that Tom mentioned and a graphic of what this kind of residential commercial development would look like. So please be sure to look at that. Um, and with questions, it looks like we've got questions from Peggy and Bob. Hi, Tom. Um, thank you for taking my question. I, um, I just started looking at this. I have to admit, I've been really not paying much attention to it with all this other stuff going on. And I, am, I plan on to personally make a comment um, to this, uh, to the thing, but, and I want to study it more, but I talked to Colin at length about what's going on at the Northern Lights Rezone. And my concern is that, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with that one, but they're going to be taking out, I believe 60, I think it's about 61, 62 residences, which are the trailers. And they're going to be putting the, the trade-off for, for the, um, what the uh, developer has proposed is, I, I believe it's like 32 residences. And, and so where I'm confused, there's, there's two issues. One is a concern of having the amount of housing because um, I don't know if you were around in the 90s when we lost 200 and, um, 211 residences at, at the uh, trailer court, the 36th Avenue trailer court, um, which were never made up. And so anytime we start, even though that's not technically in the Spinard Community Council area, it is right across the street from our boundaries. And it was part of our community council for a very, very long time. So because the Midtown Community Council doesn't seem to be on top of residential housing or be interested in it, um, we are going to 
at least Bob and I are going to be making some kind of comment. The thing is, is that it seems that the way things are right now, there is, uh, they are allowing the planning as it is, as it stands now, is, is that they are able to take out all this residential housing at the trailer court at the Northern Lights subdivision. And so I guess where I'm a little confused is that, but the, the new plan would make it so that there's even more, the allowance for even more commercial. And maybe you can explain that to me, like how is that helping with our housing issues? So what the R4A district does is different from a commercial zone is that it, it, um, it ensures there's a, um, a minimum amount of housing um, per any given parcel or land area, which is about 20, we, we, 20 dwellings or 20 residences per acre minimum. And so that's a, that's a, a kind of a, a bottom baseline. And some of the incentives for allowing more commercial uses depend on the applicant providing even more density or if you will, housing opportunity um, of 35 dwelling units per acre. So the R4A is, it allows mixed use in, but it, it still allows residences. The, uh, the purpose of allowing more commercial is to just provide for a more flexible zoning district. And uh, we, we believe that the district will still provide uh, that enough minimum amount of housing, so. Lindsay, I have another question. Um, so, so Tom, what, what are the different commercial uses that are precluded right now that you're thinking of allow, you know, that would be allowed in the future? Because when you alluded to things like restaurants, what, what, are, what are the differences that, you know, what would be permitted now as opposed to this, this new change? Yeah, so, uh, first of all, the best place to look for that is in the uh, exhibit containing the amendments. And we've formatted it so we've annotated it. So every, every page you open it up, you have you know your left page and right page. And the left page is the explanation about what's all the changes in the code and the right page. So um, in there, uh, when it gets to the allowed uses table section, for R4A, um, that annotation page just has a, the, the first one for that use table has just a great one page summary of what uses are, are being allowed into, um, into, the, into the zone. And uh, the, the uses are, are, the general idea is that it's just allowing a, basically a wider variety of of uses that are still supportive or compatible with the residential mixed use environment. Um, it's not allowing the full array of commercial or um, you know industrial uses in, but it's allowing, oh, you could have, uh, you know, there are some really, I don't know, uh, cot I'm sorry, I don't remember the specifics, but like a, a cottage crafts types of businesses, um, um, maybe more food, commercial food businesses. I'm, I'm not answering this very well because I can't quite remember. Um, That's okay. We, we, we know that the information is in the, on that sheet on the website. And I'm going to move us to Paul's question and then move, shift gears over to, to JJ's rezone. Question, but Paul, you have a question? Yeah, I mean, as I was taking the city planning at Florida State, this idea from Duwani came up of a mixed use development. I own a mixed use building in Spinard, your downstairs commercial, upstairs residential. To, to Peggy's point about um, you know losing housing units, there's discussion in the assembly right now about increasing the restrictions on zoning and uh, code enforcement, or not code enforcement, but code. What about, is there any argument on the other direction to lighten up on code and allow investors to build properties at a better price to provide more housing? I mean, in a community like Spinard, 
you know, a trailer park is one thing and there's housing there and it's affordable and people have been there for a long time. However, improving the neighborhood, if we could upgrade from trailer park mentality to some kind of different use with more uh, or less restrictive codes, is that something being discussed? Uh, yes, that's one of the three main goals of this change is to, to increase the flexibility of the rules in this zone and actually, frankly, make it easier to read and use. And uh, so appreciate that. that that's that's the, the general idea. And, and so a lot of that does have to do with more flexibility to allow a wider variety of, of uh, commercial uses. Um, and uh, it, it also makes the, uh, there are, you know, you're mentioning Duani and mixed use uh, codes, form-based codes. It, it also tries to make what standards there are in there about creating a great street facing building uh, simpler. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and Paul, that's a really good question to segue into a proposed rezone from JJ Brooks. Uh, right now it's a trailer court uh, to this new, uh, or not new, but this updated R4A multifamily residential mixed use district. Um, so Tom, thank you. I hope you can stay on for this discussion. It's almost an extension of this. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to JJ to share more about the property he currently has, the future use for it, and why he's seeking this free zone. So JJ, thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen share that I just did? Yes. Okay. So hey, just as a, you know, just a little bit of background, when Lindsay first started talking about the R4A, she, she said something really funny that at least I thought it was funny. She goes, yeah, you know, I, I look at all the, you know, the numbers and the codes, and then I have to look it up. And, you know, I've been through a rezone and I've been in the real estate for about 25 years and I still have to look it up and try to navigate it. Um, so I've worked with Tom Davis in the planning department a lot over the last, I've owned this property for about 17 years. And Tom's been great to work with and his staff has been great to work. The planning staff is great to work with. And my direct experience was when I, I wanted to build the Rustic Goat and the Turnigan Crossing apartments because I live over there. And I wanted a place where I could walk and bike and get a cup of coffee in the morning and a, uh, you know, get a beer and a pizza at night. And the planning department was unbelievable. Uh, we created a small mixed use zone as an experiment so that I could figure out, so I could learn lessons and figure out, you know, where the risk was. And we went from putting the property under contract to getting it rezoned in about seven months. And I did a presentation at the Urban Land Institute of Turning and Crossing. And when I mentioned that to people who are in San Francisco and New York, it just made their head spin to think that we could have that type of cooperation. And so when we put the property in the contract, I quickly created a little website and I met, um, I met the president of the Turning, I mean, Turning Community Council and I had the, you know, the assembly people come out and I said, this is what I wanna do. I wanna build a cool little place for people to come and get coffee. Anyway, fast forward and I've got that project and I really have learned a lot. So what I have here in front of you is, you know, about 17 years ago, we bought this parcel you know, you know, and it, we own most of the trailers. We own most of the mobile homes and we rent them. There are some pad renters there. There's an old warehouse and there's a couple of old shacks. And we've been removing some of the trailers as they become uninhabitable. And we've had some issues there. Um, so essentially what I wanna do is, you know, is try to take the lessons learned. Now I, wanna, I wanna address some things like that Peggy said. Um, because she was referring to Plaza 36 and, you know, jail properties developed that. And I know, I know those guys pretty well as a finance person, I financed a whole bunch of their projects that didn't finance those, but uh, some other things they did. What was interesting is, is, you know, the planning department, I don't think really wanted that, uh, those, that office development to happen. And they went to the assembly and the assembly trumped Tom, correct me if I'm wrong there, but <clears throat> the planning department got trumped. 
And uh, so here's something that's really important to know now is since I've owned this property, we've designed, you know, con you know, just ideas that we just, me and my partners kick around lots of different things, you know, could we build office? Well, right now with oil prices collapsing and, and Hill Corp buying BP's interest, <coughs> they're not moving into the BP building. They're going to stay in their building on, you know, center point. There's tons of sublet space, you know, office just doesn't work. So I don't think we need to worry about office going there. <coughs> Uh, big box isn't going to work and it's going to get, you know, and, it, and we wouldn't build it there anyway, but, you know, we're over retailed in Anchorage, so you're not going to see any big retail. But when we built Turnigan Crossing, my goal was, is I know that restaurants have got about a 50% chance of failing. So I can fill an apartment at a certain rent. So I knew that if I borrowed a certain amount of money, no matter what, if the restaurant went upside down, excuse me, <coughs> I could pay it back with apartment rent. Anyway, the um, <coughs> the economics still don't wake work. I think on paper, I probably lost money on that project. Um, anything I design on this thing, I'll probably <coughs> lose money as well because the economics in Anchorage don't really work that well. So we got a designated deteriorated area so that I could get 10 years of tax abatement if I develop. Now to Tom's point, the most, what I've been doing recently to do research, and, and if I, what I was worried about is rezoning this to R4A, and if they got a minimum density, which they do, it was 35 units per gross and 20 units per net, is would that force structured parking? And that structured parking with 25 to $70,000 of space, it basically makes apartments once again uneconomical. But if you can surface park, I'm, you know, I won't lose as much money. So, I'm not, I'm not complaining here because I do this for fun, but my, my point is, is that, you know, with R4A here, we can, we can build 20 units. So on that upper square, that's about 100,000 square feet. And we've got about nine parcels there. And that upper parcel, I could build, you know, we're looking at, you know, I could build a minimum with, if that's, if with net, there would be somewhere around 40 you know, 40 or 50 units. Now to give you an idea, I mean, we've got, I think with all, the, with both mobile home parks, I think we have 120 scattered across 10 acres. So now we can, we can create better quality density, but I want to do it with a mixed use character. And when you were asking about what uses, the types of uses I'm thinking of would be something like, you know, the rustic goat, but I'd like to see a bicycle shop. I'd like to see, you know, um, there's a handful of little maker spaces, I think, but you got to remember these are mom and pops and at the highest credit, and, you know, you take a lot of risk that these businesses are going to be successful. But I think those are the type of complementary businesses that if you live in an apartment building, you could walk across the property and then go to a coffee shop or a pizza place or go to, you know, grab a beer or whatever with your friends. And ultimately, you know, I, I don't have anything really that I, I know I can build here yet. But I know that moving it to R4 rate will allow me to create that kind of complexity that makes, I think, a property more successful in the long run so that there's synergies. And other properties don't have it. So I think this would give me a little bit of a competitive advantage. And that's kind of proven itself at Turnigan Crossing because I really don't get that much turnover in uh, occupancy. So anyway, uh, no, no real big plans, but that's the, that's the general overview. Great. Um do people have any questions about this? It, it might be hard to see on the map, but it, we're basically talking about the properties at 36th and Arctic and Chugach Way is also kind of that, that other road on the line, yeah. Um, I got a question because I, I, we lived over on Wisconsin for a little while and uh, Rusted Goat became like our favorite place. So we used to go there like three times a week. Um, parking was an issue, but then across the street, they had a, a, a parking lot open up, which I can't remember if that was there the whole time anyway, but I'm kind of curious, um, those, the units that are there right behind Rustic Goat, um, how big are those or what size are those units? Hey, hey Jared, I want to, I want to uh, make, I want to remind everyone here about something that happened there because you brought it up about the parking and then I'll tell you about the, the apartments. When we started that project, I thought it was just going to be a coffee shop, like a small coffee shop with lots of apartments. And the community council 
didn't really want me to do that. They wanted a sit down restaurant. And so Kathy Gleason and all the different people came together and they just said, will you build a restaurant? And I've never built a restaurant before. And the people that the guys that own the Moose's Tooth are a couple of my closest friends that started that. Like I leased them the original building and I leased them the original brewery and I rock climb with, you know, Rod, you know, all over the world. We're close friends. And so when they came to me to the, and I talked to Tim Gravel who owned Kaladi Brothers and I said, Hey Tim, do you want to build a coffee shop? And he said, yeah, definitely. Well, when the community said we want a restaurant, well, I went back to Tim because he's my friend and I committed to him. I said, well, do you want to build a restaurant? And he said, sure, I'll build a restaurant. Well, the restaurant went off and I think it did because we, I, you know, I love that place. It's got, I got a lot of pride of ownership. Tim really deserves the tip of the hat here because he was the one that integrated the old growth Douglas fir timbers and recycled those and created a lot of the character. And so it was pretty cool. But anyway, and so that, and then that's what created the pressure. And then everyone came together and solved the parking issues because it was, I think it was everyone in the community's best interest. Now, I, all the properties around it, if you haven't looked, they've all been improved and rebuilt. And I, and I think that's what my goal is here is, is to build something that has a lot of, creates community. So the apartments that we have there, I have, you know, originally we we're gonna have 12 units there. Well, with lots of different issues with the site, it got whittled down to six units. They're each about 650 square feet. Um, you know, living room, kitchen on the ground floor, bedroom, bathroom, top floor, and then the garage on the, on the ground floor. So um, very expensive to build, but um, knock on wood so far, there's been pretty good occupancy. Well, yeah, I just want to chime in and then I'll shut up. But I, I, I do want to, um, kudos to you guys, because I love eating out. It's one of my favorite hobbies and that place was quickly, yeah, it was very fast game, one of my favorite places to eat. So we love it over there. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jared. I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat that are really supportive of the idea of this um, rezone future project. A lot of support for not only the rustic goat developments, but you know, this coupled with uh, Cook and Housing's work on the other side of Chugachway uh, on their Spernardis project would really help infuse some redevelopment in this area. So when JJ came to our executive board, we wanted to consider if, if we as a council would wanna take action, we can either support the project by passing a resolution, uh, we can take no action that could either support the project or, or just you know, not, not taking a resolution or a position forward um, and then oppose the project. And our executive board was, um, considering supporting the project. So we did have a draft resolution to share with the group tonight. Um, and I'm going to see if there's a motion to consider. I could share my screen to show it as well. It is on our website in the meeting handouts, but it's hard to uh, make sure that you all get it. So I'll share my screen um, and see if we'd like to consider the motion and then have any more discussion on it. But I will open the floor for a motion. I'm looking at arena as a potential. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to move uh, the resolution. Okay, so doo -doo -doo, here it is. Um, so this is on our website, and basically the resolution just states that a lot of the Anchorage land use plans uh, have this area listed as mixed use residential commercial um, from the. Anchorage 2040 land use plan, uh, the Spinard Corridor plan, which has been adopted, by the way, by the assembly, by the policy committee. It is final. <laughs> it is a real thing. Um, also, uh, just, just ensuring that this aligns with the, uh, the different zoning districts that are in all of those plans. So it's a basic resolution that just supports um, JJ's proposed rezone because it aligns with these plans. So I wanted to see if there's any discussion on this resolution as we consider if we wanted to sign it. Real quick. Yeah, Paul. Uh, JJ, do you have any idea on your cost per square foot for your residential units? <laughs> nice, Paul. Um, I had to ask. Yeah. Um, the residential and, 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 units- And could okay. you go to a higher density? I can go, that's a really, those are both um, 
uh, questions asked by somebody who's probably uh, been through this. So, and, and third, by as a side, I am in support of this. I, I like the idea. All right. Well, those apartment units over at Turnigan Crossing. Let's put it this way: they cost me well over two hundred thousand. They cost me over two hundred thousand dollars a unit. And that's about six hundred fifty square feet per unit. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So the. You know, I'm not going to give you exact number, but the return Doesn't on the cost is around six and a half percent. And what that okay. means is a property that that trades at a seven cap, I, on paper, I lose money on this thing. But because, but since I don't sell, since I own, I don't lose money. But that's no, I, I, I totally understand. Okay, so yeah, the the apartment units. The only way it makes work is if you got a cheap cost of money. Mm -hmm. And right now, there's a moment in time. That makes this work. So I've owned this property 17 years. Nothing's happened because I've never had enough demand drivers to make anything work. No, they're, 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 we have a residential shortage in town, which is something I'm concerned with, which I'd like to see more of. I have 70 units in town and they turn over in minutes with angry people who don't get the units. So I, I like right. this idea. Well, I'm also concerned. About, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to address the other question. It was like, could I do more density? The problem with more density, let's just say that because it's mixed use, right? So mixed use is difficult to finance. Um, so I, mean, I, I, I know how to get it done. That's, that's my, what I did for a living for years. But what's interesting is, is, is a project like this might be a $20 million project. So could I build more units? Yeah, I probably could, but can I afford to do that? No, I just don't have that much money. But how do you 20 million, you said 12 units? No, no, no. That's if I did, that's if we did, if, if on this one there, if we did up to 70, we can do up to 75 units on that okay. parcel right there, plus about 6,000, 7,000 square feet of commercial. And the, the, the issue is, is yeah, you, the zoning code will allow you to build more, but the reality is, is can you economically do, can you financially pull it off? And I, you know, between me and my partners, I don't want to get that far out of my, over my ski tips. I want to build a, a decent density enough to make the synergistic work between the commercial and the residential work. If I don't build enough residential, the commercial doesn't thrive. No, I understand. I'll, I'll let it go with that. I mean, I think uh, Lindsay wants to get to, do we support this or not? And I, I would second if there's a motion to do that, to support Ooh, this. Perfect. Paul seconds. Um, maybe we had that already. JJ owes me a coffee. I'm losing track. <laughs> Um, we haven't had to take formal votes by a Zoom yet, um, but I wanted to try it tonight. And if there's amendment changes or any discussion that we need to have, we could always vote next month. But I'm going to start with just to see if there's any opposition. Uh, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, so I believe we are all in support, members of the community council who can vote. I'm gonna call that good. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll go ahead and sign this. I'll, I'll connect with you, JJ, on this. Um, and Tom, I really appreciate you being able to share more about the um, R4A uh, land use designation so we could have more information as we consider this. All right, so with that, I feel like I've learned some things about planning. Um, I'm going to turn it over for the, the next topic. Uh, we, I'm excited for this one, uh, Spinard Road Rehabilitation. And this is for a project overview for the section that wasn't completed uh, from 30th to Minnesota. Uh, so we've got Sean Baskey with the Department of Transportation, and we have some other folks from Dowell and uh, part of the project team, but wanted to have Sean here to share an update with the Community Council about this project and what we can be looking forward to. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Baskey. Unfortunately, I don't have a webcam because the state of Alaska can't uh, get 4,000 webcams all at once once COVID hits, but uh, you can see my picture there. So. Um, Thank you everybody for allowing us to come in and, and uh, share on the project. Um, so again, my name is Sean Baskey. I'm a project manager for the Department of Transportation. And we're talking about the Spinard Road, Minnesota to Benson um, project. First, you may be asking, why is the Department of Transportation involved on a road 
that is owned by the municipality of Anchorage, um, which is Spenard. So um, long story short, uh, this project was nominated by AMATS, which is a, a, a joint group uh, between the municipality and the Department of Transportation. And so they've nominated a federally funded project, which is why we're here. And uh, the Department of Transportation pushes forward those kinds of projects. So it's a federally funded project with a match uh, put forward by both the department and the municipality of Anchorage. Um, and then we're working in close participation and coordination with the, with the municipality of Anchorage's project management and engineering group to develop this project and, and push it forward. Um, because ultimately this is a municipality of Anchorage road. We need to make sure that we've got everybody on board because it will be owned and maintained by the municipality moving forward in the future as it is right now. Uh, so really this project has started um, only about a month and a half to two months ago and we're just getting moving. Um, so I can share my screen to you know show you not much but what I can show is uh, the project boundaries, which basically takes us from Minnesota to Benson. And there's not a lot of definition on this uh, for, for a reason, um, because we are really just getting started. We're gonna have survey crews out there here in the next few months, um, starting to pull together data um, certainly, there's been a lot of efforts in the past uh, that have been progressed, both by the Department of Transportation, the municipality of Anchorage, um, you know, certainly significant planning efforts uh, with the corridor plan and other things. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of good background information to, to work from. But as a federally funded project, we kind of need to um, check a lot of boxes that um, need need their due time. But um, it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to, to progress a project in the area. Um, so like I mentioned about six to eight weeks ago, we brought on the design team headed by Lounsbury. And so they're the ones that did the last phase, uh, Benson to Hillcrest. Um, so they were the, the lead designers, um, the, the project primes on those. Uh, and of course that last phase was put forward by the municipality of Anchorage. Um, so one thing to clarify, because we'll probably get questions about this moving forward, is that Minnesota uh, intersection is only in the picture in that we're doing some minor pedestrian improvements in, in the area. Um, you know, previous projects uh, and other efforts by numerous groups included potential uh, couplets and, and other things that is absolutely not part of this project. When AMATS pushed forward this project, they specifically wrote out, uh, you know, us doing anything at that intersection. So um, that might be good news for some people and, and uh, bad news for others. But overall, uh, that is not part of the project. So that might alleviate some of the concerns. Uh, so outside of that, this is a kind of our, our first stop is to hit a, hit the Spinard Community Council, tell you we're in the neighborhood, that we've got a lot of efforts going on behind the scenes, trying to collect data and, and progress so that way we can push forward uh, the project. Um, we will have websites, um, open houses digitally, um, you know, in the, in the, in the coming year, we'll have uh, we'll have a presence at the transportation fair, which is scheduled on the 18th. That I'd recommend anybody that's interested in any projects within the municipality of Anchorage and just on the borders and outskirts of it. Um, personally, I've got about four or five projects just in the municipality, and uh, you know another 10 projects outside of it. And so. Um, We'll, we've got a, we'll have a huge presence both with the department, the municipality of Anchorage and others in the, in the area to talk about everything that's going on. And uh, we just completed a, a Matsu Borough one, which was really well attended. And um, we've got a lot of great opportunities to, to 
to talk about a lot of projects and get a lot of questions answered. Um, but like I mentioned, uh, we've kind of got a blank slate sitting here in front of you and the we can I can you know I and my team you know have have been involved in a number of different projects in the area. Certainly we've brought forth uh, you know the team that worked on the previous phases of Spinard Roads. So there's a lot of familiarity there. Um, but this is a federally funded project and so we are kind of um, going back to the drawing board on a couple minor items. But one thing that we wanted to make sure that we don't do is make assumptions. And so one of the things that we're, I was hoping to accomplish today was to come in and get feedback on what, uh, what does a successful project look to you like moving forward? Um, you know, what things can we focus on? And uh, yeah, so we're hoping to hear from you guys actually. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for, for joining us, Sean. I put the link to the transportation fair in the chat. It's gonna be a virtual fair this year. Um, and then this project has been part of the Spinard Community Council's recommendation for the, for the capital improvement projects for a long time. So we're excited to see it moving forward. Um, does anyone have any feedback you wanna to provide to the team as they get started? Any successes from either that section from Benson to Hillcrest that you'd like to see continued or um, other feedback or input? We've got a few minutes to take some feedback. What's the possible, to what de degree are we going to have any kind of integration with you got your way? Sure, excellent question. Um, so we'll be doing some typically on these linear projects uh you know we'll be doing some of the approaches to it we don't usually kick down uh those side streets very far because the the funding is really targeted at the the main thoroughfare certainly um access improvements and other things are, are all potential things on the table though to make sure that there's good safe access to to public approaches like Chugach Way. Mm -hmm. It looks like um, Karen's got a question and then Paul. Great, thanks. I'm looking for uh, the north end of Spinard Road. I love it. <laughs> um, I just see how much more people are walking and biking and how it's really slowed traffic down to enable there to be a lot more safe uh, passage for bikes and pedestrians. Um, and I'm just wondering if in this plan, there would be any type of um, consideration for uh, roundabouts, like um, potentially at Spinard and 36th or you know, some of the other spots there where there might be a little bit uh, of congestion. Excellent sure. question. Uh, yeah, we can we can certainly look at you know uh, intersection improvements and and you know that's that's always on the table. Uh, I would say that the Department of Transportation has a roundabouts first policy. Anytime we're looking at a signalized intersection, we look at roundabouts first because of all of the um, the the proven uh, statistics behind you know why they why they make sense in a lot of ways. Um, they also do have negative impacts uh, associated with right-of-way acquisition and purchase of, of private property, but all of that would be balanced out, you know, as we, as we move forward. Thank you, Paul. I mean, the carousel is on that stretch, so you're muted. We can't hear you, Paul. Oops, how about that? There you go, better. Yeah, that's right about that. Um, we have some footage between 32nd and 33rd on the, on the west side, but how much would we lose in parking? Because we're being squeezed from the west by Cook Inlet, who's taken over that side. They've taken over the south side of our property. Um, do you have any idea on, on the north side what might be going on with 
the I'm assuming the west side of Spinar between 32nd and 33rd as far as in, 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 you know into our parking area. Excellent question. Um, so ultimately, the answer is it's too early uh, yeah, to I to agree. answer anything, right? Uh, so right now we're we're <laughs> we're a blank slate, but you know any any uh, improvements on the roadway potentially uh, have impacts on neighboring parcels. And as we saw north of here, you know, on uh, on that Benson to Hillcrest portion, you know, it does have impacts on on parking. And so this is a federally funded project. There is a federally mandated process that takes an extensive amount of time that you would see, um, you know, our right away agents speaking with you about any concerns that you may have. No, if I, there are, I understand. yeah, if there are impacts to the property, but you know, right now it's it's too soon to say that you know there will be um we, we haven't even selected a uh, an alternative for you know what the road would look like yet and that's yeah, really I mean, this amount of funds what would be nice is to deal with homelessness vagrancy drug addicts theft you know everything else going on on this strip, strip of spinard i mean it's nice to put flower baskets up but that's not our biggest problem in spinard thanks paul um, we've got Irene and then someone on their iPhone, and those will be the last two questions that we take. Okay, my question is about the roundabouts, which I'm a big fan of in general, because I think they are a good smooth move of traffic. But honestly, I cannot imagine right now where I have ever walked and pedestrian access at a roundabout is easy and safe. Do you have just a tidbit, 30 seconds on how that works? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Uh, so the roundabouts, the the studies are there that say that you know on a single lane roundabout, you've got you've got some pretty great uh, track records for for walkers and bikers because your crossings are are that small, right? When you get into multi-lane roundabouts, and that's you know where I start feeling uncomfortable too, when you're crossing multiple lanes coming from one direction and you know there might be cars hidden behind other cars. And so, you know, I'd say it's too early to tell, you know, if we were to move to a roundabout, how many lanes would be in certain directions and what other things. But overall, there's there's a, a really good track record with improving safety um you know to to date i i don't know that we've had one fatality at a at a roundabout in the entire state of alaska and we've moved from signalized intersections where we would have had numerous numerous fatalities and so crashes will occur but you know there, there's a proven track record with roundabouts improving safety across the board um it, unfortunately Okay. Crashes okay. do continue to occur. Thank you. I just was having sort of a blank, but that helps a lot sure. to hear the track record. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. And it looks like someone on their iPhone, if you can just introduce yourself and ask your question. The floor is yours. Looks like they're connecting to audio. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> yeah. My name is Apollo Smalls. Um, I've just, this is just, uh, it's kind of new to me. I'm kind of new to the area in Spinard. So, um, but I think uh, a roundabout is a, a good idea um, coming from, I'm, I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida. So uh, there are a lot of roundabouts being put in there where I'm from, the neighborhood I, I grew up in. I think that um, you don't, uh, you don't have to like worry about the timing and, and you know from the signal lights and stuff like that. And uh, I actually think that the roundabout at that um, in that area is a good idea, especially for like the bike riding and people that um, you know go on walks and stuff for exercise, which I do. So I I, I think that's a a good idea. Yeah, and I just walked the corridor, you know, with my son and then biked it uh, just a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, you know, and the rest of our team did the exact same thing to try to experience it on the ground. 
Um, and so, yeah, um, there's certainly some opportunities to make some improvements. And, and I, th I think there's a lot of great potential and possibilities for us moving forward. Yeah. Great. Thanks for joining us, Apollo. Julie, let us know that you'd, you'd probably be calling in, so welcome. Um, uh, thank you. And thanks, thanks for being here, Sean. Um, I know that we'll have you and the team back as this project moves forward. Uh, Tom McGrath just said, you know, this process started in 1993. Are we there yeah. yet? <laughs> so right. it's, it's a, we know it's a long slog, but we're excited um, to um, have some engagement on this. So thank you for coming tonight. Yeah, and so just, you know, in that vein, um, you know, quite often we'll get the question, well, when are we going to be out there in construction? And all we've got authority to proceed on right now from the federal government, who's funding 90 some percent of it, is to do the environmental document. Once we, and so that kind of decides what, uh, what the project looks like. And so over the next year or two, we'll be working on that, uh, you know, and, and we'll certainly be following the context sensitive solutions uh, approach with the municipality of Anchorage. You'll see a, a lot of us. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of interaction here. And then, you know, after that, then it'll be another couple of years at least. So you probably won't see us out in construction minimum 2025. And so we will a federal funded process uh, takes a, certainly a long time. Great. Thank you. So we're running up on time. So I'm going to move to our next topic and be really brief so that we can have more time for uh, neighborhood and community announcements and uh, potentially stay on a little past 830. Um, but the topic that we have on the agenda is uh, from the executive board. We wanted to bring forward the idea of having a survey to uh, hear from you about traffic calming needs in the community council. One thing we do as a community council is we can hear um, where roadways within our neighborhood need some small repairs when it comes to making them safer. So that's thinking of things like roundabouts and smaller roadways uh, or speeding down your block or um, turns around parks that are dangerous. Um, you can think of things for traffic calming like speed humps or speed tables, like those raised intersections, um, uh, narrowing of uh, intersections. So those kind of curb bulbs uh, are a few different ways that you can have some traffic calming. And typically what happens for the city is that a community council will pass a resolution uh, specifically saying, hey, we would support some traffic calming on this roadway because of these reasons. And oftentimes we kind of do one-offs, like a community member will say, hey, this is a problem. And we go through a whole process to get the resolution. And then we hear from other people saying, well, hey, what about these other roads? And, and our community council hasn't passed a resolution on this in a while. So we wanted to bring a survey forward so we can gather feedback now and prioritize some recommendations so that we could in the next month or two bring a resolution to our meeting uh, to pass. Basically, we would recommend to the city some roadways that we would like to see traffic calming on. And then there's a traffic calming department that would review our resolutions and identify roads that they could do a speed study on or an, uh, another different studies to identify if the road would be qualified for traffic calming. It just puts it in a priority for funding. None of it is all guaranteed, uh, but we have received a few emails in uh, the last few months and then our discussion last month with the uh, Anchorage Police Department around speeding issues and, and other things around safer intersections uh, made us that we wanted to bring this forward. So um, what we have proposed is a survey so that we could collect your feedback. We don't have to have it all tonight, um, but we'll, we'll post this and share this on social media and email it to our listserv. Uh, but we are hoping to get input from people. You can rank uh, roads that we currently have on a list based on past resolutions from about 2005 to now. There are different roads that we have on our list that haven't been acted on. Um, and so we want to see if they should still be priorities or not. 
uh, or if there are other roads that have never been considered that we would want to see some changes on. So that's basically what we're hoping to do is just have gather feedback and have a resolution that says these series of roads, we would like to see some, some safer um, treatments on the roads. Uh, it would still go to bond. The city voters would have to vote and approve it. Uh, there's a whole process there, but uh, we wanted to bring it forward instead of uh, missing opportunities to weigh in on this. Does the executive board have anything they wanna share? Before I go to you, Jared, I'll just, I'll turn to Peggy since she's on our executive board to help share more about this. Um, yeah, actually it's more of a question, Lindsay. We did discuss this, it's, it's come up several times over the last couple of years and I'm, I'm glad we're addressing this, but looking at the survey, I realized that maybe it might be a little confusing to people, like if you're talking about North Star, like or West 40th, what section of the road are we talking? Would the people in the comments be able to say, you know, maybe from point A to point B or, you know, we do that? Yeah, I am hoping that people in, in the comments could put a specific segment of a road. Thank you. Jared, did you have a question? Yeah, hey, sorry, I was gonna ask the survey. Do we email you guys or, or you personally, or is there a, is it gonna be on the, um, the website? I posted it on our website, so it's on our home screen and I'll make it bigger. Uh, but perfect. I also just added it to the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I think this will be really helpful. I've, I've been to community council meetings where we talk about one speed hump and it's a little difficult. So hopefully we can gather a lot of input and, and go from there. So those are all the topics we have on our agenda and we've made it to our community um, announcement section. Uh, and this is an opportunity to share issues that are important to you. If you're new to the council, we'd love to have you invite your, or introduce yourself. If you have any questions, uh, we, we can follow up with you. Um, this is a general section, so you could also share about events, things going on in your neighborhood, et cetera. So I turn the floor over to you all. I'm going to um, turn it over to Stan first. Peggy, do you have something you your hand is still up if you wanted to. No, okay. Okay, we'll go to Stan. And then if anyone else has anything, you can raise your hand out of the chat or just wave. Uh, but go ahead, Stan, welcome. Hi there, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, There we go. So I'm here to advocate for repairs and rehab at Northwood, uh, Northwood Park. <clears throat> um, those of you who don't live nearby as I do probably have seen it as you've driven down Northwood. It's to your west as you go between Spenard Road and International Airport. Really a lovely facility. There's the wetlands, a uh, little pond with some islands um, and three viewing decks. And it's the viewing decks that bring me here tonight. The problem is they're, um, they're sort of rotting away. I don't think they get as much maintenance as they need. So that's basically um, my, my quest tonight to try to get the council behind uh, some effort to get some maintenance and repairs on, on, on these facilities. So the first problem is wood rot, particularly on the, on the rails of the decks where the wood is horizontal and of course it traps um, water and that's a, <clears throat> perfect prescription for rot and the uh, deck does never seem to get painted or at least not very often so the wood <clears throat> the wood does rot another problem is that some of the um, pilings that the decks are mounted on seem to be sinking now this is a corner on the uh, south viewing deck and it's notice if you're out there instead of just looking at a picture it's noticeably lower um, than the other parts of the deck. So, you know, that, that shouldn't be allowed to continue. Um, here's some more examples of wood rot. This is a deck rail, and as you can see, it's <laughs> rotted all the way through, and you can see the board below it and a little stripe of a sidewalk there. Um, <clears throat> another case of the same thing, um, Northwood Park. Uh, more rot, and then here is the east viewing deck. And this corner, um, and this is right along Northwood, that's what you'll see if you just drive by. 
This corner also is is sinking. So I don't know when was the last time that that this had any uh, maintenance, but I think it really needs some. So I am here tonight in hopes of enlisting the council support by letter resolution or uh, capital uh, projects plan or something to get some attention to Northwood Park. It's a great neighborhood enhancement um, on its way to becoming a neighborhood embarrassment and <clears throat> maybe one day a neighborhood endangerment. If it gets rotten enough, I assume it'll be closed as a public safety hazard. So that's my pitch. And if I may add one thing, I'm so unfamiliar with this process, I actually don't know what the next step would be if the council wanted to support this. Yeah, thanks for bringing that forward, Stan. Um, I think what we could do is uh, send a letter to Parks and Rec to find out some more information about this. Typically, when we want to consider a park project for funding, we do that in the capital improvement project process very exciting, um, where we recommend parks, trails, and roads that we would like to see improved. So roads like Chugach Way and Spinard are some of the big road projects that we have. Uh, other park projects that we've wanted um, and prioritized are things like Yuri Park, which is now finally on the bond potentially. Um, so it's kind of a process. We usually take it up in the spring so that we can um, the, the city has a timeline to, I think, receive recommendations by the end of May. So we can find out as much as we can this winter, and then okay. it could potentially be something that we prioritize for next year, but it is a long process unless potentially there's a big immediate safety concern and we can convince the park to the Parks and Rec to address it sooner than okay. later. All right. Um, so that all sounds good. Is there something I can or should do or? How about I follow up with you? It seems okay. Yeah, let, yeah. Let, okay. we'll follow up as a community council with Parks and Rec. Okay. Find out some Very more good. information, and we could bring it back to the next meetings or so. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it looks like Paul has an announcement. Uh, two things. One, any new members that are here tonight or first time show up, please uh, say hello and introduce yourselves. Number two, uh, we have uh, an opportunity. Our last mayor is gone. Uh, there's a, a question about a uh, special um, election coming up. If you have an opinion on this, you know, please contact your assembly person. Put that out there. That, that's all I have to say about that. But we have a very turbulent times right now in Anchorage, and it's time to get involved if you've been sitting on the bench. Everyone here, I'm assuming, has not been sitting on the bench. But... Uh, you know, right in, folks listen, it, it, it does matter. Mm -hmm. Whether you're for or against it. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Do we do we have any assembly members here tonight that represent Spinard? No, we had Judy join us. She's an aide to the assembly, but now we only have Cameron Presfordia as our assembly representative and the assembly meeting is tonight as well. Oh, okay. So when, when will we get a replacement for, um, for Austin? So that's what Judy shared about, that there's it's not considered a vacant seat. So Austin's seat is open or empty until she steps down as acting mayor. So that could be, uh, okay. I don't know when that would be. It would depend on if there's a special election for the mayoral seat, um, that, that that information. Our executive board did reach out to the assembly to say, hey, what about this open seat? <laughs> yeah, we're um, underrepresented here. Yeah, yeah. But the, the lawyer, um, Judy shared with the lawyer, had to say about that earlier. Okay, thank you. Can we get Nikki Rose to step in? I don't think we can have anyone step in. No, the seat stays vacant. Until so we're not represented. Yeah, we that's right. We have one representative for the assembly, which is the same as the downtown district. But of course, we all voted for two assembly members the next time around. So we're in a, a difficult position. Yeah, I think I think we'd be without. I think we'd be down to one uh, assembly person until June first if they don't have a special election. Too long. It's a long time, yeah. 
Um, does anyone else have announcements, questions, things you're thinking about? Irene, you're muted. Did we did we skip over the audit for the? Um... Oh yeah, I think we did. Okay. I don't. Do we have an update, Irene? Irina, sorry. Irene, Irina, <laughs> Irina. No, um, we'll share, have something more substantive next month. Okay, just wanted to check. Thank you. Thanks. No, anything else? Okay, I think that we'll call it. Uh, we had a lot of information this time and a lot of links in the chat. So follow us on Facebook. I think that's maybe the easiest way for us to get information out in a timely way because our website is a little bit funky, but we try to put as much on there as we can. Um, and if you have any questions or if you have any topics that you want us to cover, you can email spinardcc at gmail.com and that'll come to me. I check it somewhat regularly, but be persistent. Um, but we, uh, as an executive board, we meet a couple weeks before our community council meeting so we can put together an agenda and reach out to presenters. So hope um, to have different information uh, ready to go in the middle of the month. Uh, so thank you all for your time, your engagement. I know there's a lot going on locally and statewide and beyond. So really appreciate everybody coming together tonight. Next meeting is December 2nd? Yeah, the, it's wrong on the agenda. The next meeting is December 2nd. We're not going to meet again in November. Um, so with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. So Thank you. Irene seconds. Great. Thanks, everybody. Second. Thanks, Paul. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.